Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are today. Welcome to He for She Summit. We are very excited to be part of Change Now. My name is Edward Wageni, and I'm the head of uh, He for She. And hello, everyone. My name is Dina Limbacha, and I manage the He for She Champions program. Today is a very special occasion for us because today we have He for She Champions made up of heads of state, uh, uh, prime ministers, uh, CEOs, and university presidents from around the world who are committed to uh, addressing gender equalities. For the last few years, we have been working hard and with the part in the partnership to solving big issues like equal pay, ending gender-based violence, and most importantly, getting men involved. All of these champions are here today to share their journey with you, and most importantly, to share their he for she proven solutions. This is the culmination of all of their hard work, and we really hope that after this event, you will take these solutions forward and implement them where useful in your businesses and in your communities. Let's kick off with a short video to show you all what they've been doing so far. We want to end gender inequality. And to do this, we need everyone involved. I think it would be fair to say that my colleagues and I have been stunned by the response. This cannot be a burden just for women. We men must play an active role in ensuring a more just world. It's about engaging governments, businesses, and universities and having them make concrete commitments to gender equality. It was up to me to make sure that particularly women are getting the position and the opportunities to be successful and fulfill their potential. Within three or four years, we're going to have equal pay. I want Schneider to be a place with gender equality at every level of our organization. We invest an enormous amount in communities and female micro-entrepreneurs around our minds. The assumption that women and girls look after the home and the family not only discriminates against women, but limits men's participation in society. I sit before you now, having nearly a quarter of a million of the law enforcement population in the UK signed up to this already. We shall commit ourselves to ensuring that there is no gender-based violence, there will be no child abuse, no forced early child marriages. We want to help other companies also take steps forward. And part of this liberation movement requires that we call out and break down these social norms and barriers to our well-being so that we may all be free to be our true selves. Tonight, the skyline is a bit dimmer. Many iconic buildings are turning off half of their lights to illustrate the amount of power that's lost without the equal inclusion of women in business, education, and government. You're my best friend. You're my best friend. Partners and friends, he for she champions, greetings. Six years ago, when we looked at the state of gender equality in the world, we felt there was a need to try something new, which was to engage men and boys as allies in the struggle for gender equality. We wanted to make sure that there were clear steps and actions 
around which we could collaborate. The invitation which we issued to men and boys to be part of He for She was to end the era of bystanders. We wanted to make sure that men and boys could become allies and work for gender equality in the spaces they occupy. We remember well Emma Watson's landmark speech, urging men and boys to join the movement. And all that we created through the Impact 10 by 10 by 10 champions and the He for She thematic initiative. This was the first time the UN system had male leaders, governments, private sector, academia coming together to work for gender equality. Together, they generated more than 90 commitments to address some of the world's most pressing gender issues. Today, I'm delighted that each of the HIFOSHI champions will be launching a proven solution to share what they have learned and how these lessons could be adapted to other organizations and institutions. After today, with our partners sharing 40 solutions, no one can say they don't know where to start. No one can be a bystander. As we begin to emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, my hope is that these proven solutions will feed into the gender equal and inclusive world that women and men must rebuild together. So what is next is that we will continue the journey with some of you. I am pleased to announce that the BS Group PwC and Vodafone have renewed their commitments to He for She for the next five years. And joining them will be Howard University. This new group with more to come will form the He for She Alliance and they will continue to add to the library of solutions to achieve gender equality. They will be operating from a generation equality forum framework, which culminates in Paris in July. Each champion's work will also contribute to one or more of the generation equality action coalitions. We thank you very much for your contribution and for this long journey that we've traveled with you. We started this movement together it's been an inspiring journey. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director. Now, as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected us all in so many different ways, and gender inequalities have only been exacerbated as a result. So he for she partnered with YPO, a global leadership community with over 30,000 members across 142 countries, as well as the Financial Times to conduct groundbreaking research into gender parity in businesses. We are incredibly excited to share with you that this research has been completed and is being released today. So I'm delighted to introduce Anastasios or Tassos Economou, YPO's Global Chairman and Isabel Berwick, Work and Careers Editor from the Financial Times. Hello and welcome to this session. I'm delighted to be here with Tassos Economou, the Global Chairman of YPO. It's a global leadership community which has more than 30,000 members in 142 countries and it has chapters throughout the world. And Tassos is also founder and MD of iGroup. He's based in Monaco and it's lovely to speak to you today, Tassos. We've just heard from the UN's Executive Director for Women about the importance of engaging everyone for this cause. I'm going to talk to Tassos about a very particular piece of work that YPO has just done. It's a global survey on CEO gender equality, which they've done in conjunction with uh, the Financial Times, where I work as a work and careers editor. So it's a double pleasure to be here. 
Tell us why did the YPO embark on this research and why did you and your members feel that it was important to do that? Isabel, it's a pleasure to be here with you and, and thank you for the question. What I find is that there is much conversation on the important topic of gender equality and, and parity and specifically within the business community as it equates to the C-level role. I think that we are all aware of the challenges, but there has been little global research to gather insights from CEOs and especially from female CEOs. One of the uh, core beliefs of YPO members is that business can be a force for positive change. And as you hinted before, given our, our global footprint of more than 30,000 leaders in over 142 countries, but also very importantly, I think for this survey, the fact that they employ more than 22 million employees in their businesses, I think puts YPO in a unique position to gather this intelligence and share it with the broader global business community. We, I believe, are able to create insights that will help us progress from conversation to actions that will make a difference. And whilst we do not tell our CEOs what to do or how to run their business, one of our core missions is that of idea exchange and providing information to make better informed decisions. And this is a collaboration with UN Women, He for She and the Financial Times. And how did this survey come about? Can you tell us a bit about the provenance? Sure, I will. And, you know, there's a saying where I come from that says, show me your partners and I will tell you who you are. I, I feel that the UN women, he for she and the FD uh, need no introduction, but indulge me with, with a personal story. I remember when I was a young teenager aspiring to maybe be able to go and study in, in the UK, I was given the advice that I should read the Financial Times. I was aspiring to uh, study economics and the coverage, the depth, the uh, up-to-date information on economic policy apparently really helped me because in my Brazenos interview, I must have impressed the professors and they offered me a position to study there not too far away from where you were. So the Financial Times from a very young age, I think has this respect, this authority, integrity, accuracy, which I think is critically important for what we are trying to do here. UN Women, he for she, only partners with ambitious leaders to create alliances for gender equality. So in looking for partners on this project, we look to these organizations to ensure we were asking the right questions and to help us amplify the results of this important research once it was completed. And just looking to the results of the survey, could you give a flavor of some of the key insights that you took away? And was there anything that particularly surprised you or, or inspired you? And we can pass on to the people watching. So Isabel, the way I look at it is that there are some good news and some areas where we can do more work on. Let me uh, pick three insights that I think are, are relevant. The first, and that's where the good news comes in, is that more than half of our respondents, 57%, said that their organization is somewhat or significantly more gender diverse than five years ago. And for me, this shows that progress is indeed happening. Now, the second insight that uh, I took out of this is tied into some previous research that found that small groups can trigger a change in established work culture norms if they reach a critical mass. And indeed, this, this research further validated the theory. What we found is that female-led businesses reported more female diversity on their boards in senior management and in their organizations. The third insight, which I think and I, I would label as an area for more work to be done, is that according to uh, female respondents, the biggest obstacle that women face in achieving gender parity is the burden of unpaid work they have to do due to traditional gender roles such as childcare, and trust me, I'm a father and I know what that means, and household responsibilities. And this, uh, was followed by the existence of an unconscious, 
bias. So these are, I guess, uh, things to consider and an area where we can do more work going forward. It's good to hear that progress is being made in lots of areas, despite the terrible year we've had globally. And Tassos, looking forward, what do you hope the wider impact of the survey will be? So we hope that these valuable insights will inspire other leaders to create positive change in their organizations now. If, if I look at our, our own family office, I'm already a minority there. Think of positive impact that these insights can have on leaders around the world through their businesses and in their communities. Impact is, and I believe happens closer than you think. Think every day of how you treat people at work. That makes an impact. You impact them and their family. That's a really great point about the way you treat people at work. I think sometimes we look at the big picture and we forget that just our everyday actions can have a really important impact on the people around us and affect change. So thank you for that. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap this up? Isabel, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to share these few highlights from this in-depth report. And I really hope that it adds uh, to this important conversation on gender equality and drives measurable action. What I like to say is that we are human beings. We are not human doings. Let us lead by example. And it is small changes that can, can prove to be very powerful and have a very big impact. Thank you, Tassos. It's, that's a great place to finish. I think small changes are so important for all of us, for everyone watching. And it's been wonderful to be here talking to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you to YPO for sponsoring a, what's promising to be an excellent and impactful survey. And look, I look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you so much both. So earlier we mentioned the he for she proven solutions, which the champions are releasing today. And I'm really excited for the conversations that we're about to see. The champions will talk about how they are closing the gender pay gap, how they are ensuring equal representation leadership within their companies, and most importantly, what they are doing to engage men when it comes to gender equality. Stay with us though, we do have a very special guest on the way. In the meantime, I'm delighted to introduce a video message from His Excellency, Mr. Sauli Ninesto, President of Finland. Thank you, Your Excellency. Excellencies, distinguished guests all around the world. Achieving gender equality requires action and commitment from all of us. It has been a true honor for me to be a part of this important work as a he for she impact champion. We urgently need to improve the position of women and girls. But to get things right, we should not think about equality of women and equality of men. What is important is equality, full stop. Adopting this type of uh, mindset is a starting point for positive development. It can help us truly achieve equality in practice. In the next five years, Finland will be a leader in the Generation Equality Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation. We want to preach the gender digital divide. We want to bring more women in technology as agents of change. A more equal, diverse and inclusive technology is central to women's economic empowerment. It will also make technology a more powerful asset for all of us. This is what he for she and generation equality are all about. I will continue to advocate and advance this agenda. Thank you. Hello, 
Bob, it's great to be with you today. This is an important global moment because it has never been more important than today to focus on issues having to do with gender equality and having male champions for this initiative, for this great cause is really important to us. You as the global chairman of PwC have been a champion for gender equality in many different ways in your organization. And I'm so thrilled to be able to talk to you today. Um, I'd like to start by just saying one thing. First, thank you for being a he for she champion, but tell us, Bob, why has this been so important to you personally and to the organization? So Anita, thanks for this discussion today, as well as the summit itself. It's important for us to talk as a collective group not only to the participants that are listening on this webcast, but also to make sure the messages and the content that we share gets broader disseminated around the other parts of the world. Let's go back to your question, Anita. I'll take it from two perspectives. Why was this important to PwC? PwC in its own purpose statement is focused on building trust in society and helping solve important problems. Both of those issues are squarely in the center of what you just said getting better focus on gender equality. And as a result, PwC as a business, as a large global organization had a very important role to play as we think about the role of government, business and community leaders to try to address the challenges ahead of us. Now, having said that, we actually had to make sure we at PwC were doing all that we needed to do in this area to be a role model. We're a people organization. We're symbolic and representative of society as a whole. So we wanted to make sure we were walking the talk ourselves. For me personally, the leaders have to be champions of these causes. The leaders have to role model the expected behaviors and talk through and create the right environment for the changes we're looking to make, the accountability you're trying to drive and the initiatives that you put in place. One of those was clearly our focus on the male side of the equation, being sponsors, supportive, and a key ingredient for success as we move forward to try to progress towards gender equality. So we saw a great alignment with the He for She initiative at the UN and a great opportunity to collaborate in a comprehensive way. So it was very important for us not only to role model, but also to participate, to learn, and to leverage those learnings and connections on a worldwide basis to make us better and enable us to help the world be better as well. And um, I wanna just share with everybody some of the things actually that you have been doing and that will lay the groundwork for what more we need. So PwC, I think from the beginning has been a he for she champion. And I'm just gonna read some of the things you're done, you've done because there's a lot and I'm not gonna remember it all if I don't read it, but here are some of the things that I think the world needs to know about. First, you've launched a male-focused gender curriculum, which is available both on your website and also on the UNICEF training, where hundreds of people take this every year. Um, you've launched a global inclusion index to increase representation of women in leadership, which has been completed based on your data-driven approach. Um, and that shows that global leadership levels went from 18 to 74 to 47%. Fantastic, maybe we'll get it to 74%. Uh, you raised the global profile of he for she by seeking he for she commitments from network leadership teams and um, 80,000 male employees. And um, you know these are just some of the things that I think PwC has done under your leadership. And to me, what that shows is that that commitment runs deep. You made, PwC made this commitment to further support women in leadership. And one of your big areas of success, which we cover in PwC's Proven Solution is that you have actually seen the fruits of this labor. You have actually seen a significant increase in the numbers of women who are represented in your global leadership team. So can you just share with us a little bit of this journey, what it took, how you got there, and you know, tell us what issues you encountered along the way so that others can learn from your experience. Now, thanks for the question, Anita, and, and happy to share it at a very high level. But as you said, um, it is a case study 
in our PwC proven solutions that you actually share publicly at the UN relevant to the uh, he for she initiative. So by all means, I just encourage people to take a read through that. Um, first is the responsibility of executive sponsorship. This has got to come from the top of the organization. It's got to be important and there's got to be accountability for execution, not just talk, to make the progress that's needed. Second point is we have to recognize there is plenty of talented, impactful, successful women that could step up to these roles. They just need to be given opportunity. So as a result, leaders have to think creatively around succession planning, maybe organizational construct, and maybe even create new jobs to move people to those new jobs to put women in the existing business unit roles to give them the opportunity. And that clearly was the case when I came in as my role of saying this was gonna be an explicit stated goal. And it was up to me to make the tough decisions, the balanced decision, the informed decisions around the women that could step into leadership roles to get to the percentages you talked about. The other point though I wanna make is some lessons learned. First and foremost, use data. Data that gives you a sense of where that pipeline is, both structured data and unstructured data to understand the trajectory of the women that are up and coming, the future leaders, and make sure that you're helping them with sponsorship, education and the like to continue to develop and grow. What we're talking about here is giving them more responsibilities so they can demonstrate they can manage scale and they'll get into those senior positions shortly thereafter. The second piece is one around accountability. At the business unit levels, making sure our leaders, male or female, have the responsibility to drive that focus on succession planning, the need for better representation from gender, as well as other classes of individuals, as we think about the concept of diversification. Last but not least, though, is something I guess was a personal lesson. It takes a lot of time and energy to put people in the roles. You got to make sure that they are able to succeed in those roles. So sponsorship to get the role is one thing. Continued sponsorship to succeed in that role is another. And that's where the concept of mentorship versus sponsorship is really, really important. It's that mm -hmm. personal capital people will put forward. And those were some of the lessons learned that I can tell you as I thought about this and as I cascaded this through the organization, became very interesting for us to maintain and sustain the momentum for change and make sure it's not one done. And that was the opportunity I think that we were looking for, but to keep the focus on the actions. Mm -hmm. Anita, let me maybe come back to you with a question. Sure. I, I was really excited about the generation equality and the actions coalitions. So maybe talk a few minutes about where was he for she's focus and what's their vision for some of those initiatives and what are you looking to accomplish on a global scale basis? I mean, it's really building a little bit on what he for she has been able to do um, because uh, the idea behind generation equality was to create an inflection point and a real push for transformative change. So we wanted to create something that would bring together governments, the private sector, civil society, think tanks, academics, young people, and get this multi-stakeholder approach to pushing the agenda. That's what generation equality is. That's what the action coalitions aim to do. I think we have to wrap up now, Bob. So let me, in uh, wrapping up, maybe just ask uh, one last question. And that is, as we look forward, I think you and I would both acknowledge that there's still a lot of work to be done. Where is your focus going to be? And what are we gonna see from you in the future that is going to be inspirational? Well, thanks for the, uh, the confidence in PwC and myself in that regard, Anita. And thanks for the update on the uh, action coalitions. There's probably two areas where we're going to be more focused going forward. One is around the learning side of the equation. Um, everybody's talked about the concept of upskilling and enhanced skills to be mm -hmm. successful and relevant and fit for purpose going forward. One of the things we're actually working on right now is actually badges for certifications mm -hmm. in the area of inclusion and diversity and like putting it. programs in place to actually get our people certified. The second point I talked about previously, which is one around accountability. We really see a lot of momentum building around the ESG agenda, obviously a big focus from the uh, UN's SDGs, but nonetheless, transparency and reporting on progress 
in the area of ESGs is really important. And that does two things. It actually gets people focused on what's get measured, gets done. And it actually allows for organizations to get more pressure that actually forces more action from the outside world, the stakeholder communities. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm going to join your call for change. Thank you all and see you next time. Bye-bye now. Dear all, across all countries and sectors, women are paid less than men. Unfortunately, Iceland is no exception to this. Yes, for well over a decade, we have talked the Global Gender Gap Index, but we're not there yet. On a global scale, the World Economic Forum now predicts that it will take 135 years to reach parity. That's many more generations of working women. Too many. So, action is needed. In 2018, we here in Iceland implemented a new equal pay standard. It's the first in the world. It is a law which requires companies and institutions to make sure and demonstrate that they're paying men and women equal pay for work of equal value. This is still a work in progress, but I believe that here in Iceland we have done something that can be a good example to others. Ensuring equal pay for work of equal value is a human right. It also makes economic sense. It is the right thing to do, the just thing to do, it is the best thing to do. It has been my proud duty to speak out for gender equality as a he for she champion. I look forward to continue doing so in support of the Generation Equality Action Coalitions. Hello and welcome to this panel discussion on eliminating the gender pay gap. I'm Annette Young, the host and creator of the 51 Percenter, a show on France 24 English about women reshaping our world. Now, as the pandemic continues to take its toll on the global economy, 5% of all employed women have apparently lost their jobs. This compares to some 3.9% of working men. However, this global economic crisis also means that it will the time it's going to take to close that gender pay gap has increased from 100 years to 136 years, all just in a space of 12 months. Joining me is uh, Sebastian Bazan, the uh, CEO of Accor, and Jean-Pascal Tricoir, the chairman and CEO of Schneider Electric. And they're going to be talking about the steps that their respective companies have taken in order to close the gender pay gap. So why are you particularly committed to gender equality and why should other CEOs do the same? Let me start by asking you, Sebastian. I've been saying it for a long, long time. I don't see any one good single reason for paying a female less than a male for the same job. I don't see one. So since we don't see any, just go for it and just make sure that I guess you give them the same amount of pay for the similar job. So, and it's doable. Act upon it, have the right methodology, implement it, be proud about it and embark the man. The one thing, the one mistake not to do is to only act with a woman without basically convincing the man that it's also for their own good. Let me now ask the same question to Jean Pascal. Why are you particularly committed to gender equality? And what would you say to other CEOs? Yeah, well, I would endorse what Sebastian just said, the right thing to do. Uh, so moral right thing to do. Of course, uh, the society is gender balanced, so our companies must be gender balanced. And, and I would go, it's a strong business case, also more and more of our customers. On, on the, in the balance also bring a lot of more innovation and creativity in the way we work together. So uh, from the business point of view, it makes the company much better. Uh, if you, like we do at Schneider, believe that great people make a great company, having access to all the talent pool, all whatever the gender, it's absolutely an obligation. Sebastian, let me start with you. Why do you think the gender pay gap remains still such an issue for many organizations. And when you take into account, we're 21 years already into the 21st century. 
I think it uh, starts from the top. If uh, is the leader of a company wants to endure that cause, as they all should, then it's only a matter of shouting it uh, and again explaining why you want to do it. But no, it's only a question of make it a commitment, and then there's no excuse not to do it. Absolutely no single excuse. Jean Pascal. I would confirm it starts with a strong conviction from the leadership level, but at the same time, if you want to succeed, and Sebastian said it before, you have to embark everybody in the company into it on starting with the men, because uh, of course, if you have to operate a transition, that means you are coming from male dominated environment and they are the main agents of change. In our case, putting together a whole training of everybody in the company to educate people about the bias on the misconceptions that we can have in the company on, uh, on gender differences, on, on, uh, on impact of gender in the way we judge and assess people. All of this is absolutely feasible and it starts first by squaring your HR system, which anyway would be, uh, would be necessary, defining then what the pay gap is, making sure that people, as I said before, are educated to bias, misconception, on, on the embarked on, uh, on correcting that. Sebastian, how does addressing the gender pay gap change the organizational structure? The most difficult thing to do, as I told you, is you can pay people the same, but do you give them the same authority, the same empowerment, and the same chances in life? It has to do with having your high potential being identified, uh, having diversity inclusion within that measurement, and making sure that I guess you take them on your back and you offer them both mobility or, or accountability and empowerment, the same chances. So it's a that's much more soft, non-quantifiable, and much more difficult to do. Uh, Jean Pascal, do you have anything to add to that question? I would, I would really say it's equity of opportunity because again, salary gap, you address it, it's addressed uh, at Schneider, but making sure that you give the same amount, the same equity of opportunities to women and to men. And to be very clear, in the situation where we started from, we needed clearly to accelerate women opportunity because somewhere in the past had been penalizing women on their career progression, some of them or many of them to catch up and therefore to accelerate their career path so that they would accumulate enough experience and accelerate the kind of catch up they were deserving into, uh, into the representation at the top of the company. Sebastian, going forward, ACOR has joined Generation Equality as an action coalition leader. What does this mean for you and what do you hope to achieve? One out of three women on this planet have been facing sexism or sexual harassment. That same number for the hospitality sector is above 80%, so far more than a third. And I'm I am in despair when I actually understand that number. Either they've been, they've been victim of it or they've been witness, witnessing it. We cannot continue that way. So just again, as we have done for equal pay, just make sure you're part of a coalition, make sure you can be a leader in that coalition because that forces me to act and make sure you really tackle the three, which is sexism, which is sexual harassment, and domestic violence. At this point, I'm going to have to leave it there. I'd like to thank both of you, Sebastian Bazan from ECOR and Jean-Pascal Triacra from Schneider Electric. Thank you. Becoming a he or she thematic champion in 2018, it was a CEO of a large bank, a citizen and a father that I put all my personal commitment to advance the cause of women. We made two commitments, a commitment as an employer and a commitment as a bank. The objectives we set for ourselves at that time were ambitious, and I'm proud that after three years, they have all either been met or exceeded. For example, in our male-dominated global markets division, we have managed to increase the share of women among senior managers by 40%. Our actions for gender equality have also focused on human resources, which are historically predominantly female. How did we make it? We favored an innovative approach based on nudge techniques. For instance, 
who have ensured that at least one woman is present as a recruiter at every job interview within the global markets division, or that men write HR job advertisements, which are usually written by women. Going for beyond being prepared by, we felt it was important to also commit to opportunities external to the group. We therefore supported the AgriFed program run by the UN Women in Senegal. To date, it has helped 15,000 Senegalese women who initiated the development of climate-resilient agriculture to save the economic activity of their region affected by global warming. We have contributed in giving them access to the levers that had been reserved to men, namely training, land tenure and financing. As entrepreneurs, they can now benefit from a line of credit structured by Bin Pipaiba subsidiary in Senegal, BCs. And now, our ambition is accelerating. In 2011, the executive committee of Bin Pipaiba was exclusively male. Today, the proportion of women stands at one third. By 2025, I'm committed to raising this share to at least 40%. It is by acting in concert that we will achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goal number five. Let us stay mobilized together. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this panel discussion on accelerating women in leadership. I'm Annette Young, the host of the 51%. So what are some of the most prestigious and largest companies in the world doing to boost women in leadership? My uh, panelists are Alan Job, the CEO of Unilever, Sim Shabalala, the Chief Executive of the Standard Bank Group, and Antoine Sia, the Head of Company Engagement at BNP Paribas. First of all, I'm going to start by asking all of you a question, which is, at which point did your company realise that you needed to do much more in increasing the number of women in leadership? Well, thanks, Annette. Uh, I must admit, normally I don't do uh, male-only panels, but I guess this is uh, an exception by design. That's the uh, point of he for she. Um, we began our journey back in 2010. Um, and to directly answer your question, we realized that women made up only 38% of Unilever's management. Last year, we achieved our 50-50 gender balance um, across management. But we continue our efforts because the job is not finished. Sim, can I ask your response to the question? In deliberating amongst ourselves about what that means, our commitment to the constitution, principles of fairness, making sure that we're competitive, it became glaringly obvious uh, over time that we could not continue uh, with an organization that is uh, very well represented uh, in terms of women at the bottom end of the organization, whereas the top of the organization does not have adequate representation of, uh, of women. Antoine. BNP Paribas uh, being uh, now uh, the largest European bank, uh, we considered that we had really uh, a responsibility uh, to uh, change this. Uh, and we took uh, action uh, several years ago. Uh, for example, today, uh, we have uh, uh, one third of the executive committee, uh, which is composed of women, and we have a, a gender uh, equal uh, non-executive board. When we keep seeing figures that tell us it's going to take more than 250 years to achieve equality, I'm curious to ask again, each of you, what keeps you going? What keeps you motivated? Alan? You know, um, when we began the journey, we said we're going to take an integrated approach um, driven by strategy, measurement and culture. And it was the strategy that provided the, the motivation. Uh, we simply made it an explicit strategic priority to reflect the customers of our business better inside the organization. And we said 38% women is just not good enough Nothing less than 50-50 will do. Sim, I'd like to ask you the same question. And of course, keeping in mind, you can probably tell us more about the AR Last Mile program. 
I definitely do want to talk to you about our um, last mile program. This program, which we call the last mile program, has a number of elements. The first one is that uh, it is simply to articulate what we want to achieve. Uh, that is, we wanted to identify more women who could become senior chief executives in our business, and we set targets for those. The second element was that we needed to identify uh, and be very clear about the non-negotiable core capabilities that we need in people who are going to occupy positions of senior exec chief, uh, chief executive. The third stage was uh, to simply identify a pool of suitable candidates. Uh, and in this case, it was both men and women, and then to take them through individual development programs uh, that help to prepare them for these important roles. Uh, the program has worked incredibly well so far. Um, it's been an operation for two years so far, and we've appointed a number of senior execs, in particular two great executives that I'm very proud of, who run uh, a couple of our most important businesses our chief executive in Uganda and our chief executive in Namibia are products of this program. It's early days yet, uh, 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 but we're very proud of what we've achieved in it. I really believe that what uh, keeps us uh, motivated uh, is again uh, about uh, leadership. Uh, thanks to he 4 she and because we were challenged by the, the he 4 she program, uh, we really identified global markets uh, global market departments uh, as, uh, as a, a place uh, where uh, a lot of uh, improvements uh, needed uh, to, be, to be done. Uh, and uh, to, to reach these goals, uh, we, uh, we set specific uh, targets as part of our Forshi uh, commitment. Uh, we uh, unlock gender data uh, to track uh, our progress, uh, and uh, we developed uh, nudging uh, to uh, reach uh, our goals. So thanks to, to all the, the nudging we, we use, uh, we have uh, succeeded in uh, significantly uh, increasing the, the proportion of women in our global market activities uh, in the last four uh, uh, last year, uh, we went from 40% uh, to 50% uh, uh, in our graduate program, uh, from 31% to 41% in our leadership talent program in capital markets, and we had a 40% increase uh, in uh, the, the senior uh, management positions uh, occupied by, uh, by women. Alan, now a question I'd like to direct to you. How challenging has it been as a journey and what have you and your team learned along the way? Well, yeah, of course it's been challenging at times, but it's also an incredibly rewarding uh, journey. Um, I think one of the learnings that we, the big, most important learnings has been that if you want to hire more women, hire better men. Uh, what you often find, of course, is that uh, you, are, you make the space and you create processes that allow you to attract uh, uh, senior women, but they don't stay because the environment has not changed. Culturally, it is hostile. And so not only must you be sure that you are attracting people into the organization, but you have to make sure that your processes, the way you do things around here, the semiotics, the images that you use, the language that you use is appropriate. Well, the, the main pushback was simply uh, that the, the people who were in senior management position uh, didn't uh, consider uh, women uh, to be their successor. Alan, um, coming back to Unilever, how is uh, your company driving gender equality beyond its own operations? When we work on our own operations, our value chain, use our brands as a force for good, and then use our advocacy on the system, that's our theory of change for most important things that we work on, including gender. And many of our brands are campaigning. Our brands are on a mission uh, to improve equity in the world. Probably the best known is, uh, is Dove, uh, working on uh, self-esteem uh, for young girls, but also Dove Men Plus Care, whose uh, Dove Men's particular purpose is to drive paternity leave rights, which we know are good for women. Sim, 
Changing cultural mindsets is very difficult and we're all guilty, both women and men, of unconscious bias. But how difficult has it been for you to get your male colleagues on board and to get them to understand the importance of boosting the number of women in leadership? One of the programs that we've introduced in the organisation is uh, what we call barbershop sessions. Um, these are a series of facilitated conversations for men um, about issues at a high level, these constitutional principles, but also things like toxic uh, masculinity. Uh, what does male allyship mean? Uh, what does gender-based violence mean, uh, both on the continent and in our business? And a group of men at Standard Bank have been trained in this barbershop uh, process uh, and they've been trained as power shop uh, facilitators and they're tasked with leading these conversations in their own businesses and throughout the organization. Antoine, I want to ask you in your opinion, what does um, the workplace look like? How does it differ when you have more women managers? Part of our mission is to provide uh, gender equality to the to the world uh, uh, we uh, we live in. We have, uh, uh, for example, uh, in uh, in Senegal, uh, we have uh, uh, worked uh, in uh, helping uh, a community of uh, sixteen thousand uh, women in northern Senegal uh, that were developing resilient. Uh, agriculture and now uh, they are able to be corporate clients of BNP Paribas, not only uh, microfinance clients but corporate clients of BNP Paribas. Um, we're running out of time and I've got one last question to reach equality. Is there anything positive that's going to come out of what we're witnessing at this point in time? Alan. Uh, I'm an optimist and people have become much more aware of the big issues and challenges of society. So whether it's climate change or rampant inequality, we're seeing a big shift up in conscious consumption. Brands that are championing a cause, companies that are conducting themselves with decency and dignity, um, and an awareness of these types of issues uh, as, as there's a definite rising sentiment. And I hope that that rising sentiment will uh, lift the cause of creating a gender equal world and a gender equal working environment. And at this point, I'd like to thank all of my panelists for giving us some of their uh, um, time. And that's it for this session. Hello, and welcome back to the He or She Summit. My name is Taylor Nicole Rogers, and I am a correspondent at the Financial Times. I also have the honor of moderating this conversation on the role of men. Now, as we know, women have always been at the forefront of the struggle for gender equality, but we can be so much more effective when we have the support of our male counterparts. And that is what we're here to discuss today. We have a lot to cover, so let me go ahead and introduce our superstar panel. I'm delighted to welcome Jess Staley. He is the CEO of Barclays. Henri Broussel also joins us. He is the Chief Operating Officer, End-to-End -end Design to Delivery at Dono. And the Global Managing Partner of McKinsey rounds out our panel. A big welcome to Kevin Speeder. Jess, why don't I start with you? In a male-dominated industry like finance, how do you begin to engage the men in your organization in the work towards gender equality? I think the first thing is, uh, obviously starting with the leadership, is to recognize, in my experience, the most powerful instrument to, uh, uh, to create loyalty and to keep uh, employees that want to stay with your firm is to embrace diversity. Barclays is just a function of our intellectual capital. And I believe embracing diversity and embracing gender uh, is the most effective way to keep and retain and to hire intellectual capital. And that's why it's so important. Thank you for sharing that. Henri, Dono has over 100,000 employees across 57 countries, I believe. So how, do, how have you engaged the men in your organization 
you know, despite their different cultures and different generations. Our commitment has been to implement a gender neutral parental policy. And the, this policy helps to transform the stereotype that caregiving is predominantly a woman responsibility. Each family is unique and it's key to provide employees with the flexibility to take paid leave based on the caregiver role they want to play, not based on their gender. We have a program called EVE, that, which is a behavior change program based on the conviction that men and women are co-responsible of the gender glass ceiling within the organizations. Men, because they probably don't voice enough, not asking for promotion for pay rise, and men, because they don't realize women have a different behavior, have a different angle, don't, don't talk the same way. And with Eve, we have really changed the mindset, helping playing uh, a rude role in the career path while being fully aligned with the e 4 she philosophy. Thank you, that all sounds great. Kevin, my next question is for you. You know, McKinsey specializes in developing manage management strategies for others, but I'm wondering what strategies you've employed within the firm to make sure that all of your male partners are engaged in your efforts towards gender equality. How do we enroll men to really be the force for good that they can be in this, that they become allies for change? I heard Henri talk about the EVE program and I heard Jess talk about the anecdote story he told about people in the Barclays context. Well, for us, what we've tried to build is a story of allyship where people understand that we can collectively make a difference. In fact, our program is called All In. We're all in this together, men and women. And we want to achieve gender balance because we know that that is a better outcome for all of us. And that means that we've spent a lot of time building up ally programs around the firm, around the world, inclusive leadership training for our partners and our colleagues, and really a step forward in terms of making sure that there's a very visible commitment that isn't just coming from the top, but really permeates the whole of McKinsey. As we all know, the past year has fundamentally changed all of our workplaces. Because of the COVID crisis, many of us are working from home or struggling to find childcare as schools are closed. Some of us are trying to parent and work at the same time. And unfortunately, women have borne the brunt of this impact on our working lives. And so Jess, could you tell me a little bit about what needs to be done to make sure that progress that we've seen in the workplace for women has not gotten erased? If there's a silver lining to this pandemic, Taylor, it very possibly may be what it will do to uh, embracing diversity and particularly helping women in the workforce. <clears throat> and that's because what we've all learned is we can keep, you know, the McKinsey's and the Nones and the Barclays of the world functioning with the majority of our people working from home. I actually think the pandemic, one of the benefits will be uh, reinforcing the flexible workspace, which is I think very powerful for helping uh, our senior women employees at Barclays. Absolutely. Um, Omri, I'm wondering, what do you think business leaders need to do to support the women in their organizations, not just during the pandemic, but afterwards? We have ensured that our employees and the women working within the organization and in our ecosystem worldwide are fully supported through extensive coverage of health, childcare, adaptation to the quarantine times, flexibility, well being programs, because working from home is a very different pattern than working in an office. So we, we implemented a lot of programs that we are continuing and we intend to continue for the next years. So for instance, in UK and Ireland, uh, we have developed working parent online group coaching program to provide additional support to working parents, as well as an economic support mechanism for employees whose family circumstances may have changed because of COVID. Wonderful, thank you. Kevin, I'm wondering, what do you think companies can do to prioritize gender equality as our workforce continues to look towards the next phase? I think when it comes to the office and the notion of 
creating greater flexibility so people can work and women in particular can work in a fashion that is much more realistic given their personal and other priorities. That is the opportunity we have now and it's essential we seize it. It's why when people say things like hybrid work and, and start to talk about that as an idea, at one level I agree, but at another level we need to really make sure we don't end up creating a whole second class citizenry of folk who do not come to the office versus folk who do go to the office. And in that moment, we could actually go backwards. We could make it much worse. We've all been on the video conference where you've got four people in a room together in person, two people on the video coming in remotely, and very quickly you forget about the two people coming in remotely and things get worse for that group. They become less relevant. So it's not straightforward. We need to really work at this notion of hybrid work and make it relevant and well, well executed for everyone, but women in particular. Absolutely. And that flows perfectly into the next thing I wanted to ask you, Jess. What do we need to do today in the next six months, in the next year, to make sure that we hold on to the momentum that we have today? Ultimately, we will solve this when men and women recognize that, that the senior women have to become part of the network. And men have to move forward to building personal relationships with senior women and vice versa so that so that these senior town of women become part of the network and therefore become part of the solution of a, of a firm going forward in the uk we created a function five years ago where every committee at that level of the bank every management committee has to have an ex officio member in almost all cases, the ex officio member is a woman. And it is simply to, to, to get senior women access to the network of an executive committee or a management committee. Thank you. Henri, I'm wondering from you, what actions do you believe men need to take to support our work towards gender equality? As male leaders, being in the decision-making position, we have the power to change the game and to challenge the status quo faster than a lifetime. We must be advocates for giving not only the voice, but also the power for women to lead the conversation, to lead the network and to make the decision. Actually, we need to change the power dynamics. We took the commitment to say in 225, we will be at full gender parity at the, all the senior leadership position. And I think this is a very strong commitment. And now everybody in the organization is really accountable for this. Thank you. And I certainly share your hope that commitments like the one you just described can get us to true equality during our lifetimes. Kevin, I'm going to leave you with the last word. What can we do to make sure that we do see equality in our lifetimes? I completely agree with Jess's point about actively sponsoring women so that they're part of the network, they are supported, and they, they do feel that they're being systematically encouraged to keep moving along the development curve towards senior leaders. That's vital. It's not happening in sufficient form. It's happening in some companies. But how do we make that more institutionally? Because women are not promoted to the next job at the same rate as men. That's a vital point of change that has to move forward. So look, I believe we can make this progress but it is going to require a step up from where we are. Otherwise, we will not achieve this goal within our lives. But I also believe that we can. And I think with the courage, with the wisdom, and with indeed the actions that we've been talking about today, that progress can be made. And let's hope it is. For my two daughters' sake, and sure for all the others who are part of this with uh, daughters they want to see in senior leadership roles going forward. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for being here today. I feel like I've learned so much from our wonderful panel. And I personally am feeling hopeful that we will achieve the equality we've been talking about through some of the measures that our great panel has brought up today. So thank you all for taking the time to join us. I really appreciated your attention and I am looking forward to seeing the rest of the summit with all of you. Thanks again. Incredible insights. Thank you so much, everyone. And for the audience listening, these He For She proven solutions are live right now on the He For She website. So go to heforshe.org and you can download them. All of these champions have done the hard work for us 
And so if you are looking to tackle a similar issue in your business or your community, you now have a library of tried and tested methods to choose from. Moving on to our next section, I'm very excited about these next conversations. The champions will talk about the shadow pandemic of gender-based violence and what they are doing to eliminate it. They'll talk about how they are creating new cultural norms across university campuses and how they are engaging the future leaders of tomorrow. Our university partners are literally shaping the minds of young people and we are incredibly proud to have the opportunity to work with them. Before that, I'm delighted to introduce our next guest and a very special one. Please welcome Jerry Horner, singer, songwriter, businesswoman, and author, in conversation with Nick Reed, CEO of Vodafone, and Bruce Cleaver, CEO of De Beers Group. Hi, you may have heard me say the word girl power. What does that really mean in this day and age? Feminism? Feminism in the dictionary means the equalization between men and women. In this modern day, we wanna have a conversation that talks about supporting women and we need your help. I feel absolutely honored to be here for the United Nations UN Women He For She. And today we're gonna to have an open conversation with some heads of companies, how we can learn from each other. Everything is welcome here. This is an open conversation and I'm really excited to be here. We have the head of De Beers and the head of Vodafone. So um, first of all, we're gonna to speak to Bruce Cleaver from De Beers. Um, Bruce, would you like to tell us a bit more about the, the De Beers journey for the He For She campaign, which has been under the umbrella of the United Nations. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, um, we've been proud participants in He for She, and I've been a thematic champion since 2017. Some years ago, we looked at the inclusion and diversity in De Beers, and it frankly wasn't good enough, and it, it, it simply wasn't good enough. So we, we really knew we needed to do something, and we looked around to find a credible partner who could help us in this journey. And we found UN Women and they found us. Um, and together we've been on an amazing journey. You know, we come from a largely a mining business and um, inclusion and diversity has historically proved more difficult there. But we set out with an ambitious goal to double the rate of hiring in senior appointments in uh, women across De Beers in a three year period. And we stuck to that and we beat that target, notwithstanding the pandemic and a really tough time for the business. And so can we bring Nick Reed from Vodafone? What's your experience for uh, the He For She campaign? So we did some research uh, on uh, uh, gender uh, or domestic violence um, across 107 countries. We found that 15 percent of women had experienced some form of domestic violence in the past year, 15%, that a third of them had, had, had a drop in productivity as a result. So this is a huge and massive impact, and, and, and we need to stand up and tackle this. So we said we needed to, as a company, do a domestic violence policy globally for our business. It involved 10 days safe leave. It involved access to uh, information support, financial service support, uh, flexible working. So we gave a package of support. And it also involved training of managers and HR uh, reps through our business to ensure they understood how to deal with certain situations. So we did a very holistic uh, uh, approach. Uh, and what I'm really pleased is one year on, we did a survey of people and survivors are actively using that policy. I mean, people are using three to 10 days. What for? Going to court, going to see the police, moving home. So, you know, real tangible issues they were facing and we could be there for them. And at the same time, it was great to hear back from managers saying, not only could they give support for the team, but also they could be advocates in the, in the society and also support their family and friends. 
So you're having a wider impact than just within your business. It goes a lot broader. And we're working with a lot of companies now who are saying, please give me your toolkit. We're giving them the toolkit, the research, the policy. We make it all available on Vodafone.com so that they can go on that journey with us. Okay, Nick. So what else um, is Vodafone doing? One of the key things that we've been focused on, other than internal policy, is using our technology. We call it apps against abuse. We have a portfolio of different apps and we've built up a base of users of 1.3 million using the various apps. The most recent one is Bright Sky and we launched this and it's mainly focused at allowing someone uh, to understand their relationship, understand whether it's a safe relationship or whether it has abusive uh, aspects to it, that it points people to what are the different types of abusive relationships so it has an educational aspect to it. If it's an abusive relationship, what's the nearest center that they could get support? And just then also allows them to log the various incidents that happen. So it's a real support for survivors. Uh, in an anonymous way that they can use and also other people can help uh, survivors. So we've been really uh, rolling this out across Europe and Africa and we now have over 100,000 users of the app and importantly there was a 75% increase in the downloads of this app over the pandemic. So it just goes to show again that the shadow pandemic uh, that happened around domestic violence is more relevant than ever. Bruce, you yourself have done a huge amount for um, supporting women and, you know, building on that momentum, you know, what, what are your thoughts of how you can move? What's next? Well, we have very ambitious goals in a number of areas, you know, things like becoming carbon neutral by 2030, uh, things like four jobs created off mine site for every one job on the mine. So all of yeah. what we do is part of a holistic strategy, uh, which is very much focused around our sustainability strategy, which is very much core business. And I think that is a big point. This needs to be core business. It can't be something that maybe 10 or 20 years ago was a nice to have. This is the business as far as I'm concerned. Now, we've discovered um, through the pandemic, though, of course, in the countries in which we operate, that gender-based violence has increased a great deal. And we've done a tremendous amount there on both advocacy and access. We've also learned, um, interestingly, that even though some of these countries are geographically close to each other, you have to be different in different countries because they're different challenges for you to overcome. Um, I think we do have to step this up more um, in the future. I think one of the key things for me about advocacy is we've got to do more with men uh, in communities, not just in our organization, about being positive influences here. So we've got a really interesting way of doing this, for example, in Botswana, where we get the message out not only through local radio stations and through Facebook, but we engage very much with the community, with business leaders, with football players, with traditional leaders, with faith-based leaders. And I think we've got to do more there. I think we, we, we've got to make sure, in, particularly in remote areas, that there is no stigma attached to, um, to being a survivor and that it's important that people talk about these difficult topics. So it's not, it's not just providing uh, physical safe spaces, and we do a lot of that, and providing counselling, and we do a great deal of that. It's also about how you help people talk about this more and uh, destigmatize it. And then the other part of that for us, which we've been really focused on through the pandemic, is trying to get to the root cause of this, which in many cases is poverty, extreme poverty. So we have a great program called Accelerating Women Micro-Owned Entrepreneurs. And we've supported a thousand women owning very small businesses around our communities. You wouldn't be surprised to hear, Jerry, that women reinvest the proceeds of their businesses back in communities and men don't uh, as a rule. So we invest very much in women here. But this is really so that we can help them become less dependent. And I think there's a lot more work for us to do there in trying to set ambitious goals to help lift people out of poverty. That is a really key way of addressing the, the gender-based violence issue. So even though lockdown was on, underway, we trained women with digital skills and the kind of skills they need for the future. We helped them source government grants, et cetera. So we have tremendously ambitious goals. And I think you should never stop with these. I think if you meet one, you need to set another one and you need to continually set the bar higher and higher with ambitious goals. I think you got to, you mentioned it earlier. It's okay if you don't meet all of them. I don't think that's the point. The point is, are you ambitious enough? Are you authentic enough? And do you keep pushing the boundaries? 
So none of us is there yet, and I totally agree with Nick as well, that this can't be done by one organization. You've got to partner with people, with other corporates, with NGOs, with UN women and people like that. That's the fastest way of doing this. The truth is there's a long way to go. The truth is there is a long way to go, but it's brilliant that everybody is opening the conversation. We've talked about education. Education empowers, but also it's prevention. But I'm wondering if you know there's something to be looked at for everyone uh, uh, for our youth, of, you know, for the younger generation to actually inspire them. So obviously to imp inspire the girls through education, but also the young boys, everybody deserves the chance to grow, you know, and the only way we're going to do that is by sharing that information like you, Bruce and Nick, you two are doing that. You're le I'm, I, I've learned from you today. Nick, what's next? We're doing a lot to drive uh, an increase in women representation in leadership roles. And I think that is really fundamental because it will build different businesses and play a part to how those businesses engage with society. I'd say the second thing is that, that what we're really focused on is working with other companies, sharing research, sharing thought leadership, like Bruce, you know, sitting down and saying, how can we be more influential together as a community on the rest of private sector? Uh, because, you know, there's a, a, a big range of companies uh, that, that are either not progressed at all to being very progressed. And this is a really important subject. So I think the private sector needs to be vocal, needs to be visible and needs to show leadership in this area. And, uh, yeah, you know, whether it's uh, gender diversity or whether it's domestic violence or for gender equality, difficult subjects that you have to say, we stand for this and here's what we're going to do and then offer it to others to copy or, or take our lead. Brilliant. It's been really, really inspiring. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time. And I'm sure everybody listening today, we haven't got, we haven't got so much uh, Zoom gloom. Just been, it's been very uplifting, so thank you very much. Hi, Simon Pegg here. I'm showing my support for He For She and the safety of women in public spaces. Women and girls have been demanding change louder than ever before, but the COVID pandemic could set gender equality wins back more than a generation. Behaviour is influenced by culture. 40% of women don't see themselves represented in advertising. 90% of parents aren't seeing good role models there. There are twice as many male characters in films as there are female characters, and they are twice as likely to speak. At the 2021 Academy Awards, only two female directors were nominated and only nine people of colour represented in the nominations. We need more women in leading roles and need to see changing attitudes about how to treat women. We can't see what we can't be and the way people are treated on screen affects the way people are treated in real life. We need to tackle toxic masculinity so that everyone is safe and free to live their lives. At school, at work, at uni, or just out and about after lockdown. UN Women UK found this year that 95% of women in the UK are less likely to report sexual harassment because they simply don't believe it will change anything. We have the opportunity to change something now. That's what He For She is about. Taking a moment to see if we can do more to show respect as friends, parents, co-workers, managers. Gender equality is good for everyone and public spaces need to work for all. Are you with us? Good morning, good afternoon. I would like to welcome our audience today to the very topical discussion on how to address violence against women and girls and the role that different actors can play in doing so. So we have an esteemed panel today to address some of these uh, questions, and I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Carl Fox, who's the Chief Constable in North Wales Police, Professor Paul Guaynayne, 
the Vice Chancellor at the Kenyatta University, and Professor Vahan Agopian, President of the University of Sao Paulo. Welcome, and I would like to move to the first uh, question. So we just heard in the first panel discussion from business leaders on how they are tackling gender-based violence. But of course, it goes without saying that violence against women and girls happens everywhere. And it's a complex phenomenon and we all have a role to play. So if you can please tell us about the work you are doing in your space and how you would have been able to, uh, what you have been able to achieve. So if I can please start with Mr. Carl uh, Fox, over to you. Dioc, thank you very much. So um, first of all, everybody has the right to feel safe wherever they are, whoever they are, and, and should not feel responsible for other people's behaviours. Uh, I think the tragic merger in London recently around Sarah Everard has put a real focus on policing in the UK of what are we doing and what more can we do to tackle, uh, um, tackle and protect the most vulnerable in our society. Um, so policing in the UK has some clear work streams that have already been in place so around rape and serious sexual violence, around domestic abuse and around stalking and harassment. But we've recognised that we need to do more. And that is specifically around safety in the public place, around the criminal justice system and how we target offenders that are, that are committing this, these levels of violence, around how we record incidents and crimes going forward, uh, and so we get the biggest picture we possibly can. There is something around our own behaviour in policing and how do we challenge some inappropriate behaviour and how do we make sure that we are responsive to those that, that need our help. How do we engage the community and how can we do engage people that are suffering from violence um, more, more effectively? And then how do we monitor and, and use scrutiny better? We can only do that with the support of partner agencies. We can only do that support of, uh, of groups. And we can only do that as a, as, a, as a more joined up system approach. Thank you very much. And over to Professor Paul Wienaina, please. Uh, for us uh, at Kenyatta University, First of all, we have recognized that um, the issue of gender violence is really pervasive. And because of that, we already have a center. We have identified a directorate, which actually takes care of all those issues to do with gender violence. First of all, we have generated policies policies for gender uh, violence, again, gender violence. We have uh, actually uh, policies to do with the um, gender enhancement, particularly where we are looking at uh, gender equity. And the uh, uh, chair, it is very, very important for us to know that uh, it is unique in a university setting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Wainaina. Very important comments. So if I can move over to Professor Agopian in order for him to share his own reflections. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a very complex uh, problem. So we have to we have a several approaches to, to deal with it. The first one, of course, is the cultural change in the, the efforts for changing the culture inside university with the community. The community has to move for gender equality. So is, that is, this is the, the work of the University of Sao Paulo Women's Office, incorporating the gender agenda at the core of the administration. Let's say the commitment of the center of administration with this problem. Tack, uh, tackling the gender-based violence from different perspectives, formulating programs and educational actions, let's say, give visibility to G GBV, organizing and leading research, in, let's say, increasing the knowledge about the GBV, measure the student's perception, communication, educational campaigns, and partnership, as it is impossible to isolate the phenomenon of GBV for the intersections with other structural inequalities. Thank you very much for the first uh, round of reflections. And I would like now to move to the second uh, question. If you can please um, 
let us know now based on your own uh, work and what you have done successfully so far, what actions do you hope individuals listening today will take going forward to do their part in ending the shadow or not so much shadow anymore pandemic of gender-based violence? Can we please uh, uh, ask uh, maybe this uh, uh, time from uh, Professor uh, uh, Wainaina? Thank you, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator. I think for us, the issue of the uh, pandemic has brought out certain things that has made our society uh, become um, kind of stressed. And we have seen a lot of this. And uh, we are trying very much, uh, particularly um, in those communities where this is happening, to make sure that uh, people are talked to uh, so that uh, psychologically they are able to be prepared. Um, we have a lot of, uh, for, for, uh, for example, in the university, we do have university, uh, you know, university chaplains who looked after the students and uh, they are doing a very good job in terms of trying to make sure that um, uh, that violence that is being caused by stress mm -hmm. is not actually uh, committed to women who look weak. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Wayne. So, Professor Agopiani, if I can turn to, to you, what would you propose that our audience should do in order, we all have a role to play after what we heard today in addressing violence against women and girls? Initially, it is clear for us that the scenario of, to end GBV and empower women and girls to achieve gender equality is a path of no return. So we have the uh, responsibility to engage men and boys to transform cultural values, practices, and actions. Thank you, Mr. Fox, if you could please share your own reflections. Uh, Dior, thank you. Uh, always difficult to follow terminant speakers. Um, so as a senior police officer, a father and a husband, I absolutely believe it, this has to be everybody's responsibility. Um, men need to start standing up and start calling out behaviours and recognising the impact their behaviours have on women and girls. And I, what I would ask those that are listening to reflect around their organ organisations, are people calling out behaviour? Are people challenging sexual harassment in the workplace? Are people challenging inappropriate language or behaviour? Is misogyny um, uh, rife in their organisations? And what are they doing to challenge those behaviours that we see? I fundamentally do think we need to stop shaming victims that come forward and report inappropriate behaviour and recognise that we need to focus on the perpetrators that are committing these types of behaviours who think it is acceptable to do so both in the workplace, in the home place and in the public place. Excellent. I would like to, to thank our audience and our panelists for this excellent discussion. During the past five years, the He for She movement has been able to mobilize the private sector, universities and governments with significant success. The multi-stakeholder partnership brought into existence numerous tangible solutions on a global scale. Our experience as Coach Holding has confirmed that business has a critical role to play in overcoming traditional stereotypes and promoting diverse and inclusive gender roles. The time has come to deepen the le lessons learned. We are delighted to become one of the private sector leaders of the Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation for gender equality. For the next five years, we will strive to ensure that women and girls have equal opportunities in shaping the future of innovation and technology. Welcome everybody to the Creating New Cultural Norms panel. I am Dr. Shruti Kapoor, the founder of Safety, a women's rights activist and an economist. Today we have with us a stellar panel. Uh, I'm going to first introduce Dr. Feridun Abdullapur, 
the University of Waterloo's President and Vice Chancellor. Next, we have Dr. Seichi Matsuo, who is a prominent researcher, academic leader, and the president of Nagoya University since 2015. And finally, we have with us Dr. John Dejoa, who is the 48th president of Georgetown University. Now, gentlemen, all of you have been in the educational sector for a very long time. And we all know that universities and colleges are where students lay the foundation of their future. They learn from leaders, they learn from their professors and peers. In your role as a he for she champion, what work have you done to, in, to, ember, to ember gender equality across your institutions? And what have been the results so far? I'm going to start with Dr. Feridun. Uh, then we'll come to Dr. Sechi and then Dr. John. Thanks. Thank you. To me, uh, <clears throat> even though uh, we've been working on uh, gender equality for a long time, He for She initiative uh, was a game changer in a way that it brought our entire ca campus community together. So we established three very measurable targets that we historically suffered with low numbers. We are a STEM heavy institution. So we wanted to see more participation of women and girls in STEM disciplines, period. We put a number, we put a three year target to meet those numbers. We needed to increase the number of faculty members, women faculty members. And we wanted to find out what was stopping us from there doing that. We put our targets, we didn't just put targets there, we worked on basically removing unconscious bias from every single hiring committee, put appropriate measures in place. And then third, a big, big achievement is we needed more women in senior leadership positions. And we need to understand what was, what was blocking their interests. What were the issues? We are now gonna move on to Dr. Uh, Matsuo. So the same question for you, if you can tell us what um, you know, um, your um, education institution in, is doing towards gender equality and the progress that it has made. Okay, thank you very much. So soon after I became a HIFOC champion, I installed a large HIFOC signboard uh, in a prominent location on campus so that students could see it every day. I also held a HIFOSI kickoff symposium in which I explained our university's commitment to make HIFOSI a success. I also uh, included the gender equality session in the student ori orientation program uh, through which all first year undergraduate students learned about the importance of promoting gender equality and how serious now University is in tackling the subject. Uh, coming to you, Dr. Dejoa, uh, the same question for you. When, when we joined He for She, our university established three central commitments as part of our work to advance gender equity. We focused first on strengthening our commitment to a respectful and safe campus for all community members with a particular focus on preventing and addressing sexual assault and sexual misconduct. Second, we supported the work of our university-wide Georgetown Women's Alliance to help strengthen, to, to deepen the culture where women can thrive. And the third was advancing the role of women globally through our Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. Thank you for all your work. Uh, moving on to our second question for today is, um, if we can learn a little bit more about the solutions that you are going to be releasing today and what should be the key takeaway from it. So we're gonna start again with uh, Dr. Feridun. Um, so what are some key, uh, solutions that you are planning to release today and share with us? Um, we have put in a number of very prestigious he for she scholarships. We wanna grow those. One of my, again, uh, very active fundraising efforts is to build that fund more. We have seen enormous, enormous benefits of this. We have been able to recruit some of the great talents who would never have an opportunity to go to university. And they are 
flourishing. They are thriving. And this is an absolutely great thing. Uh, moving on to Dr. Uh, Matsuo. So the same question for you, if you could share with us uh, some initiatives you know, uh, that, that you're doing um, at the organization and what and some solutions that you're re releasing today that we can hear about. Uh, women's representation in management and academic positions at Naga University is relatively low. So to increase this, we uh, took five steps. So step one is setting visible comparing goals and rewards. So step two is to create an environment that meets women's needs, removes barriers to progress, and provides development opportunities timely for more women to succeed. We operate two nursery schools and one after-school facility on our campus to support the work-life balance of female researchers. Step three uh, is to create a new working culture. And step four, is monitoring and evaluation. The most important step we have taken is the introduction of incentives and the penalties uh, related to the numerical uh, goals of faculty appointments of female scholars. Faculties that do not meet these goals will have their budget cut from the university. Well, and uh, those that exceed their goals will receive more. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Dijon, if you'd like to share the same for us, please. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the proven solution that we, we, were, we are sharing focuses on our commitment to build and sustain a respectful and safe campus for all. And an important aspect of this is preventing and addressing sexual misconduct and sexual assault. A second key takeaway is the importance of protecting vulnerable communities. Our climate survey results also showed us that members of our LGBTQ communities, our Black, Asian, and Latinx communities, our students with disabilities were much less likely than other students to seek support from institutional resources to address incidents of sexual assault and misconduct. And we sense focused on intentional outreach to student affinity groups, taking seriously the idea that we must build trust proactively with our students from these communities. Thank you and amen to that. Uh, more power to all of you doing this wonderful work. And with that, I would like to uh, thank everybody who's taken out the time to be here on today's panel and for all the great work that they're doing towards promoting gender equality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Warm greetings to all. Allow me to start by thanking Under Secretary General and Executive Director Pumzile and UN Women for convening this gathering. I am happy to have served as an enthusiastic advocate for the He for She initiative over the last five years. In Rwanda, we continue to make progress on our specific commitments to bridge the gender digital divide advance women's employment opportunities, and eradicate gender-based violence. These and other imperatives are key to meeting our development goals. Equal opportunity for girls and women is also a priority for our continent, guided by the solemn declaration on gender equality in Africa agreed in 2004. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is negatively affecting the health of our citizens as well as their livelihoods. But it also threatens to reverse gains made toward achieving gender equality globally. We cannot allow this to happen. 
gender equality must remain at the top of the agenda. UN women and our partners can count on my personal support and Rwanda's active participation in setting even more ambitious gender equality goals going forward. I thank you. Hello and welcome to this virtual session. I'm delighted that out of all of the wonderful discussions that are a part of this year's He for She Summit that you are here with me today. My name is Taylor Nicole Rogers and I am a correspondent at the Financial Times where I report on the US labor market. But today we're having a conversation that is very near and dear to my heart and that is on how to engage the leaders of tomorrow. I'm delighted to welcome the president of Stony Brook University, Dr. Mari McGinnis. David Velasquez also joins us. He's the president and CEO of Pepco Holdings and the secretary general of the World Organization of the Scout Movement completes my panel today. A big welcome to Ahmed Elendawi. So Mari, you've had a very successful career in academia. You're used to engaging with young leaders and you know, driven students who have a lot of ideas and a lot of passion for what they want the world to look like in the future. So, I mean, how would you say you've gone about engaging with them over the past five to 10 years? So we've created a number of programs and I'm gonna tell you about one and that is our WISE program. And WISE stands for Women in Science and Engineering. And it is a program that builds a roadmap, roadmap for girls and women to pursue STEM degrees and those opportunities. So we have really two parts to this program. The first is what happens at our university where our WISE program supplies mentoring, social support, a tailored curriculum for our women scientists. But of course, giving women opportunities in these fields has to start long before they, re they reach our university. So we also have a high school WISE program that pairs high school students with Stony Brook graduate students and faculty mentors who can help them focus on particular projects to provide them hands-on experience in the field. I could not agree more. Thank you so much for that. And when students leave a university like Stony Brook, they're going to end up in the professional world. Um, so David, I'm wondering about Pepco. You employ more than 4,700 people, I'm assuming across several generations. So how do you work to engage people on the younger end of your workforce? First of all, as part of Exelon's He for She commitments, we developed summer STEM leadership academies in Illinois and Pennsylvania and the Washington DC regions. And the purpose was to encourage high school girls to pursue a career in STEM field and also help them understand they can be leaders in addressing climate change. To give you another example, we also um, have been partnering with local organizations. So one example of that is at Atlantic City Electric, which is our energy utility serving Southern New Jersey. We recently partnered with the Drum Thwacket Foundation and Sustainable Jersey to create the New Jersey Student Climate Challenge. Um, if you don't know, New Jersey has an initiative to increase climate literacy, literacy among young people across the state including a first in the nation effort to incorporate climate change education across all K-12 state academic standards. So this new contest encourages students to understand and address the local effects of climate change and develop solutions right in their own local community to help provide solutions to that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and as you mentioned, leadership skills are essential for everyone, especially up and coming leaders. So Ahmed, I'm wondering, how has the Scout movement changed its approach to preparing young people to take on leadership roles? We have taken our work to countries where we didn't have a scouting for girls before. I'm extremely proud to announce that scouting today is actually available in Saudi Arabia, and we are actually seeing more enrolled for girls in Saudi uh, compared to our program for boys. So that is accelerating really fast. I'm very proud that the very sought after Eagle Scout, the highest ranking in the scouting in the United States is now open for girls. And we just last month celebrated the first cohort of girls who have uh, really enjoyed that program and showed that they are able to accomplish a lot 
through scouting. We are seeing also that the, the confirmation coming by when these programs are extended equally to young women and girls as for boys, we are seeing remarkable results. And just one, one thing that's making us incredibly proud in scouting, that in fact, the first ever Time Magazine Kid of the Year is a scout herself, 15 years old, and to Mari comments around the STEM education, when you offer that kind of education at early age, you will see miracles happening with young people. Absolutely. And as we move into the latter half of our conversation, I'd like to pivot from the work that we're, we are already doing and focus on some of the work that we would like to see in the decade ahead. So I'm wondering if we were to focus on the essential and urgent actions that need to be done to help engage our, the leaders of tomorrow, I'm wondering, Ahmed, where would your priorities be? Obviously education. I mean, uh, it's really start with education. It's hard to imagine a way forward for anyone to be a, a, an active member of this changing world without being equipped with the tools to engage with the, with the world, with, the, with your uh, active citizenship or exercise of your rights or access to these rights, or even engaging in finding a job. I also believe that we, while we are championing things externally, we shouldn't forget our own houses and, and organizations. And we need to lead by example. It's really easy to go and make all the right speeches, but I also turn back and I know that we still have a homework to be done in our own organization. There's still more to be done in ensuring that girls, they don't feel like they are guests to the program, but they own it as much as boys. Absolutely. And David, while I have you, I'm wondering, what do other companies need to do to future-proof themselves and make sure that they do have that, ne that next generation that's ready to step up to the plate? I think all of us collectively as corporations, you know, have begun to take on the challenge, I'll say, that's out there to make sure we're, we're creating um, a future generation. I think as um, all of us as corporations, again, have looked to see that there are portions of our workforce that are aging and we need to replace that, have realized that this is, this is not something that gets assigned to an HR department. It's not something that is um, you know, not the topic of conversation, but rather it needs to be, and it is for us at Exelon, it is part of our, the critical activities we take day to day is how do we develop, how do we develop the next generation of leaders? And again, like I say, that starts long before they enter our doors. Um, it starts with us reaching into under-resourced communities in, in a real way, day in, day out. Thank you. Mari, I'm going to leave you with the final word. I'm wondering, what can we do today to make sure that we have brighter, more inclusive, and fairer leaders tomorrow? Well, thank you for that question and for this conversation this morning. And it is so exciting to see the real synergy and connection across from our programs, the scouting programs that are supporting our youth today, through to what we can do in higher education, through to the corporate sector. And it is going to take this, um, as, as you all were saying earlier, this sort of sustained energy and momentum where we are all working in concert to really be able to make a difference. And um, you know, music to my ears that you see education as the key, because that is indeed um, often long been my philosophy as well and, and why this work is so rewarding. So I'm very proud to say that as part of our commitment to he for she, Stony Brook University has now achieved 50-50 gender parity in our university council, which is our primary leadership, uh, academic leadership for this institution. So really proud that we've achieved 50-50, but obviously we still have more work to do um, in giving opportunities to young leaders and allowing them to really be part of the voice for change at Stony Brook University. Thank you for sharing that. And, and thank you all for your insights today. I know I have learned a lot from you and, and really enjoyed hearing about your work and your ideas. And I hope that our audience has as well. Um, thank you again for being here. I hope that we've given you something to think about. It's been a, a delight moderating this panel and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Hello everyone, bonjour à tous. I'd like to thank UN Women for hosting this important summit. And to everyone who's joined the He for She Summit, thank you for your work to build a world with equal opportunity 
for all. We've made important strides to advance women's rights, but in 2021, we need to do so much more. The COVID-19 pandemic threatens to reverse many of the gains we've made in the fight for gender equality, and we simply cannot let that happen. Depuis 2015, notre gouvernement travaille à rendre la vie meilleure et plus équitable pour les femmes du Canada et du monde entier. Pour ce faire, nous avons eu recours à l'analyse comparative entre les sexes plus afin d'élaborer toutes nos politiques dans une optique intersectionnelle. Un nombre égal d'hommes et de femmes siège à notre table du Conseil des ministres et nous cherchons à créer des programmes et des politiques permettant d'intégrer plus de femmes dans le marché du travail, de lutter contre la violence fondée sur le sexe et de faire en sorte que les femmes, dans toute leur diversité, participent pleinement à l'économie, parce que quand les femmes réussissent, c'est tout le monde qui en sort gagnant. Unfortunately, this global crisis has created a she session and has the potential to roll back the hard-fought social and economic progress of all women. And this is especially true for marginalized groups, including indigenous, black, and racialized women, women living with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ2 communities. Cependant, ensemble, nous avons l'occasion de changer l'avenir et de rabattir en mieux. C'est pourquoi, dans le cadre de notre budget 2021, Nous investissons dans un réseau pan-canadien d'éducation préscolaire et de services de garde abordables et de grande qualité. Cela permettra à plus de femmes de réintégrer le marché du travail, de créer des emplois et de faire croître la classe moyenne. C'est également pourquoi nous soutenons les entrepreneurs canadiennes et réalisons un plan d'action national visant à mettre fin à la violence fondée sur le sexe. De plus, Nous poursuivons la mise en œuvre de notre politique d'aide internationale féministe pour veiller à ce que les droits des femmes et des filles soient respectés dans le monde entier. My friends, it's going to take all of us working together to make gender equality a reality. And Canada will continue to do its part to advance this important initiative both at home and around the world. Merci beaucoup such powerful conversations. Thank you so much to everybody. We're almost at the end of the program, but we hope that you have been inspired and motivated to take action for gender equality. As all of our speakers have said, each of us has a role to play. Over the last few years, he for she has made incredible progress towards gender equality, but there is still a lot more to do. Today, we're sharing with you the opportunity to join the new he for she Alliance. We are looking for ambitious global leaders who will help us to continue to accelerate the pace of change for gender equality. Go to heforshe.org and there you can learn more about how you can apply. In the meantime, here's a short video about what it means to be part of the He for She Alliance. Like other human rights and social justice movements, gender equality requires action and allyship across all of society. He for She is a global platform that invites men and boys to strive for an equal world for we all. We want to end gender inequality. Since its launch by Emma Watson, He for She has become a community of millions of activists, the subject of more than 3 billion conversations on social media per year, and working with world leaders, has developed solutions for some of gender equality's biggest challenges. This year has only accentuated gender, racial and economic inequality. In this context, He for She is bringing together the most ambitious leaders from across government, the corporate world and third sector to launch the He for She Alliance. Trailblazers in their field, these He for She champions will spearhead transformative change, demonstrating the value of allyship in accelerating progress on gender equality and achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Hello, my name is Fernando de Souche, and I am the Managing Director of New Macho, a male specialist division of BBD Perfect Storm in London, England. We've heard from government officials, as well as business and academic leaders, about the work they have done and the proven solutions they can now share with us. 
It is clear that a lot of progress has been made since the launch of FIFA 14 in 2014. Although we also know that there is still a great deal more that is needed and that it varies depending on geographies and cultures. The world is still dominated by men and there is still an outdated definition and concept of masculinity. However, my view is that he for she is not a zero sum game, an advantage that is won by one of the two sides and lost by the other. This is not a movement that only benefits women. This is a vision and a mission that benefits us all. It is key that men understand that achieving a sustainable gender balance concerns us all, women and men in a way, in any way or form that they want to express their gender. Relaxing the pressure of men and the concept of masculinity will not only be extremely beneficial for men, but also it can be the key to unlock a natural space for women and the feminine to arise and balance. While he for she is a movement that has women's well-being and growth at the center, it is a movement that must be led by men. Achieving equality in this generation is not a desire, but an imperative if we are to be fit as a society to deal with the many challenges that lay ahead. Thank you. Wow, such a powerful and inspirational conversation that we've had today. Thank you to our He For She champions for joining us and for sharing your proven solutions with the world. We know we don't have any excuse for not taking action. Thank you to everybody who connected with us and we look forward to seeing you in our next He For She Summit.